and David and his men on that side of the mountain, and David made haste to get away for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them, verses 25, 26. How often is such the case with us, some sore trial presses, and we cry unto God for relief, but before his answer comes, matters appear to get worse. Ah, that is in order that his hand may be the more evident. David's plight was now a serious one, for Saul and his men had practically enveloped them, and only a mountain, or more accurately, a steep cliff, separated them. Escape seemed quite cut off, outnumbered, surrounded, further flight was out of the question. At last Saul's evil object appeared to be on the very point of attainment. But man's extremity is God's opportunity. Beautifully did Matthew Henry comment, this mountain, or cliff, was an emblem of the divine providence coming between David and the destroyer, like the pillar of cloud between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Yet, a few hours at most, and Saul and his army would either climb or go around that crag. Now for the striking and blessed sequel. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David, and went against the Philistines, therefore, they called that place the Rock of Divisions. And David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at Engedi, verses 27 to 29. How marvelously and how graciously God times things. He who orders all events and controls all creatures, moved the Philistines to invade a portion of Saul's territory, and tidings of this reached the king's ear just at the moment David seemed on the brink of destruction. Saul at once turned his attention to the invaders, and thus he was robbed of his prey and God glorified as his, David's, protector. Thus, without striking a blow, David was delivered. Oh how blessed to know that the same God is for his people today, and without them doing a thing he can turn away those who are harassing. God does hear and answer the prayer of faith. David and his little force now had their opportunity to escape, and fled to the strongholds of Engedi, on the shore of the Dead Sea. The Life of David, A. W. Pink Jesus will come to pour in the oil and wine of his presence into a hunted soul. Give other examples from scripture where people were strengthened by others of like faith or angels or even by God himself during trying circumstances. Esther 4 colon 13 17 Dan 10 19 1 Samuel 24 colon 1 15 We began our last section by quoting many are the afflictions of the righteous, the remainder of the verse reading but the Lord delivereth him out of them all, PS 34 colon 19. This does not mean that God always rescues the afflicted one from the physical danger which menaces him. No indeed, and we must be constantly on our guard against carnally interpreting the holy scriptures. It is quite true that there are numerous cases recorded in the word where the Lord was pleased graciously to put forth his power and extricate his people from situations where death immediately threatened them, the deliverance of Israel at the Red Sea, Elijah from the murderous intentions of Ahab and Jezebel, Daniel from the lion's den, being striking illustrations in point. Yet the slaying of Abel by Cain, the martyrdom of Zechariah, Matthew 23:35, the stoning of Stephen, are examples to the contrary. Then did the promise of Psalm 34:19 fail in these latter instances? No indeed, they received a yet more glorious fulfillment, for they were finally delivered out of this world of sin and suffering. David was the one whose hand was moved by the Holy Spirit to first pen Psalm 34 colon 19, and signally was it fulfilled in his history in a physical sense. Few men's lives have been more frequently placed in jeopardy than was his, and few men have experienced the Lord's delivering hand as he did. But there was a special reason for that, and it is this to which we would now call attention. David was one of the progenitors of Israel's Messiah and it is indeed striking and blessed to note the wonderful works of God of old in his miraculously preserving the chosen seed from which Christ, after the flesh, was to spring. Indeed it is this more particularly, which supplies the key to many a divine interposition on behalf of the patriarchs and others, who were in the immediate line from which Jesus of Nazareth issued. 
Strikingly does this appear in the history of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who for so many years dwelt in the midst of the Canaanites. The inhabitants of that land were heathen, and most wicked, as Genesis 15:16 intimates. Abraham and his descendants were exposed to them as sojourners in the land, and men are most apt to be irritated by the peculiar customs of strangers. It was, then, a most remarkable dispensation of providence which preserved the patriarchs in the midst of such a people, see Psalm 105:42. thus was this handful, this little root that had the blessing of the Redeemer in it, preserved in the midst of enemies and dangers which was not unlike to the preserving of the ark in the midst of the tempestuous deluge, Jonathan Edwards. Wondrously too did God preserve the infant nation of Israel in Egypt, in the wilderness, and on their first entering the promised land. Still more arresting is the illustration which this principle receives in the divine preserving of the life of him who was more immediately and illustriously the sire of Christ. How often was there but a step betwixt David and death? His encountering of the lion and bear in the days of his shepherd life, which, without divine intervention, could have rent him in pieces as easily as they caught a lamb from his flock, his facing Goliath who was powerful enough to break him across his knee, and give his flesh to the beasts of the field as he threatened, the exposing of his life to the Philistines, when Saul required one hundred of their foreskins as a dowry for his daughter, the repeated assaults of the king by throwing his javelin at him, the later attempts made to capture and slay him yet from all these was David delivered. Thus was the precious seed that virtually contained the Redeemer and all the blessings of redemption, wondrously preserved when all earth and hell were conspired against it to destroy it, Jonathan Edwards. But we must now turn to our present lesson, a lesson which records one of the most striking events in the eventful life of David. Well did Matthew Henry point out, we have hitherto had Saul seeking an opportunity to destroy David, and, to his shame, he could never find it, in this chapter David had a fair opportunity to destroy Saul, and, to his honor, he did not make use of it, and his sparing Saul's life was as great an instance of God's grace in him, as the preserving of his own life was of God's providence over him. Most maliciously had Saul sought David's life, most generously did David spare Saul's life. It was a glorious triumph of the spirit over the flesh, of grace over sin. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi, 1 Sam 24 colon 1. From these words we gather that Saul had been successful in turning back the invading Philistines. This illustrates a solemn principle which is often lost sight of, human success is no proof of divine approbation. The mere fact that a man is prospering outwardly, does not, of itself, demonstrate that his life is pleasing unto the Lord. No one but an infidel would deny that it was God who enabled Saul to clear his land of the Philistines, yet we err seriously if we conclude from this that he delighted in him. As oxen are fattened for the slaughter, so God often ripens the wicked for judgment and damnation by an abundance of his temporal mercies. The immediate sequel shows clearly what Saul still was. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. This may be regarded as a testing of Saul, for everything that happens in each of our lives tests us at some point or other. Miserably did Saul fail under it. Nothing in the outward dispensations of God change the heart of man, his chastisements do not break the stubborn will, nor his mercies melt the hard heart. Nothing short of the regenerating work of the Spirit can make any man a new creature in Christ Jesus. The success with which God had just favored Saul's military enterprise against the Philistines, made no impression upon the reprobate soul of the apostate king. Pause for a moment, dear reader, and face this question, has the goodness of God brought you to repentance? Then Saul took three thousand chosen men out of all Israel, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats, v2. What a terribly solemn illustration does this verse supply of what is said in Ecclesiastes 8.11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. 
Wicked men are often interrupted in their evil courses, yet they return unto them when the restraint is removed, as if deliverance from trouble were only given that they should add iniquity unto iniquity. It was thus with Pharaoh, time after time God sent a plague which stayed that vile monarch's hand, yet as soon as respite was granted, he hardened his heart again. So Saul had been providentially blocked while pursuing David, by the invading Philistines, but now, as soon as this hindrance was removed, he redoubled his evil efforts. Oh, unsaved reader, has it not been thus with you? Your course of self-pleasing was suddenly checked by an illness, your round of pleasure-seeking was stopped by a sick bed. Opportunity was given you to consider the interests of your immortal soul, to humble yourself beneath the mighty hand of God. Perhaps you did so in a superficial way, but what has been the sequel? Health and strength have been mercifully restored by God, but are they being used for His glory, or are you now vainly pursuing the phantoms of this world harder than ever? Ought not the very invasion of the Philistines to have changed Saul's attitude toward the one whom he was so causelessly and relentlessly pursuing? Ought he not to have realized now more forcibly than ever, that he needed David at the head of his army to repulse the common enemy? And O oh, unbelieving reader, is not the case very much the same with thee? The faithful servant of God, who has your best interests at heart, you despise, that Christian friend who begs you to consider the claims of Christ, the solemnities of an unending eternity, the certain and terrible doom of those who live only for this life, you regard as a killjoy. Saul is now in the torments of hell, and in a short time at most you will be there too, unless you change your course and beg God to change your heart. Let us turn our thoughts once more unto David. As we saw at the close of our last chapter, in answer to believing prayer, God granted him a striking deliverance from the hand of his enemy. Yet that deliverance was but a brief one. Saul now advanced against him with a stronger force than before. Does not every real Christian know something of this in his own spiritual experience? It is written that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God, Acts 14.22. Troubles come, and then a respite is granted, and then new troubles follow on the heels of the old ones. Our spiritual enemies will not long leave us in peace, nevertheless, they are a blessing in disguise if they drive us to our knees. Very few souls thrive as well in times of prosperity as they do in seasons of adversity. Winter's frosts may necessitate warmer clothes, but they also kill the flies and garden pests. David had now betaken himself unto the rocks of the wild goats. Thither Saul and his large army follow him. Once more God undertook for him, and that in a striking way. And he came to the sheep goats by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave, v3. In that section of Palestine there are large caves, partly so by nature, partly so by human labor, for the sheltering of sheep from the heat of the sun, hence we read in the Song of Solomon 1 7 of where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. In one of these spacious caverns, David, and some of his men at least, had taken refuge. Thither did Saul, separated apparently from his men, now turn, in order to seek repose. Thus, by a strange carelessness, viewed from the human standpoint, Saul placed himself completely at David's mercy. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee, v4. David's men at once saw the hand of the Lord in this unexpected turn of events. So far, so good. None but an infidel believes in things happening by chance, though there are many infidels now wearing the name of Christian. There are no accidents in a world which is governed by the living God, for of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Rom 1136. Therefore does faith perceive the hand of God in everything which enters our lives, be it great or small. And it is only as we recognize his hand molding all our circumstances, that God is honored, and our hearts are kept in peace. Oh for grace to say at all times, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. 1 Sam 3.18 
And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. It is not difficult to trace the line of thought which was in their minds. They felt that here was an opportunity too good to be missed, an opportunity which providence itself had obviously placed in David's way. One stroke of the sword would rid him of the only man that stood between him and the throne. Not only so, but the slaying of this apostate Saul would probably mean the bringing back of the whole nation unto the Lord. How many there are in Christendom today who believe that the end justifies the means, to get results is the all-important thing with them how this is done matters little or nothing. Had such men been present to counsel David they had argued, be not scrupulous about slaying Saul, see how much good it will issue in. What a critical moment it was in David's history. Had he listened to the specious counselors who urged upon him to do what providence, seemingly, had put in his way, his life of faith would have come to an abrupt end. One stroke of his sword, and he steps into a throne. Farewell poverty. Farewell the life of a hunted goat. Reproaches, sneers, defeat, would cease, adulations, triumphs, riches would be his. But his at the sacrifice of faith at the sacrifice of a humbled will, ever waiting on God's time, at the sacrifice of a thousand precious experiences of God's care, God's provision, God's guidance, God's tenderness. No, even a throne at that price is too dear. Faith will wait, ch bright. But there is a deeper lesson taught here, which every Christian does well to take thoroughly to heart. It is this. We need to be exceedingly cautious how we interpret the events of providence and what conclusions we draw from them, lest we mistake the opportunity of following out our own inclinations for God's approbation of our conduct. God had promised David the throne, had his time now come for removing the one obstacle which stood in his way. It looked much like it. Saul had shown no mercy, and there was not the least likelihood that he would do so then was it God's will that David should be his instrument for taking vengeance upon him? It seemed so, or why should he have delivered him into his hand? David had cried to God for deliverance and had appealed unto divine justice for vindication, PS 54 colon 1, had the hour now arrived for his supplication to be answered? The unexpected sight of Saul asleep at his feet, made this more than likely. How easy, how very easy then! For David to have made an erroneous deduction from the event of providence on this occasion. God was, in reality, testing David's faith, testing his patience, testing his piety. The testing of his faith lay in submission to the word, which plainly says, Thou shalt not kill, and God had given him no exceptional command to the contrary. The testing of his patience lay in his quietly waiting God's time to ascend the throne of Israel, the temptation before him was to take things into his own hands and rush matters. The testing of his piety lay in the mortifying of his natural desires to avenge himself, to act in grace, and show kindness to one who had sorely mistreated him. It was indeed a very real testing, and blessed is it to see how the spirit triumphed over the flesh. The application of this incident to the daily life of the Christian is of great practical importance. Frequently God tests us in similar ways. He so orders his providences as to try our hearts and make manifest what is in them. How often we are exercised about some important matter, some critical step in life, some change in our affairs involving momentous issues. We distrust our own wisdom, we want to be sure of God's will in the matter, we spread our case before the throne of grace, and ask for light and guidance. So far, so good. Then, usually, comes the testing, events transpire which seem to show that it is God's will for us to take a certain step, things appear to point plainly in that direction. Ah, my friend, that may only be God trying your heart. If, notwithstanding your praying over it, your desires are really set upon that object or course, then it would be a simple thing for you to misinterpret the events of providence and jump to a wrong conclusion. An accurate knowledge of God's word, a holy state of heart, wherein self is judged, and its natural longings mortified, a broken will, 
are absolutely essential in order to clearly discern the path of duty in important cases and crises. The safest plan is to deny all suggestions of revenge, covetousness, ambition, and impatience. A heart that is established in true godliness will rather interpret the dispensations of providence as trials of faith and patience, as occasions to practice self-denial, than as opportunities for self-indulgence. In any case, he that believeth shall not make haste, Esa 28 16. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him, PS 37 5, 7. Oh for grace to do so, but such grace has to be definitely, diligently, and daily sought for. We left the apostate king of Israel asleep in the cave of Engedi, the very place which had been made a refuge by David and his followers. There Saul lay completely at the mercy of the man whose life he sought. David's men were quick to perceive their advantage, and said to their master Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee, 1 Sam 24 colon 4. A real temptation presented itself to the sweet psalmist of Israel, and though he was not completely overcome by it, yet he did not emerge from the conflict without a wound and a stain. Then David arose, and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. How true it is that evil communications corrupt good manners, 1 CR 1533. Did this incident come back to his mind when, probably, at a later date, the Spirit of God moved him to write, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, PS 1 colon 1? Possibly so, at any rate, we find here a solemn warning which each of us does well to take to heart. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt, 1 Sam 24 colon 5 which means, his conscience accused him, and he repented of what he had done. Good is it when our hearts condemn us for what the world regards as trifles. Though David had done no harm to the king's person, and though he had given proof it was in his power to slay him, nevertheless his action was a serious affront against the royal dignity. No matter what be the personal character of the ruler, because of his office, God commands us to honor the king, 1 Peter 2:17. This is a word concerning which all of us need reminding, for we are living in times when an increasing number despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities, Jude. God takes note of this. David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. With this should be compared to Samuel 24 10, and David's heart smote him after that he numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done, and now, I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. From these passages it is evident that David was blessed with a tender conscience, which is ever a mark of true spirituality. In solemn contrast therefrom, we read of those having their conscience seared with a hot iron, 1 Tim 4 2, and of some being past feeling, F 4 19, which is a sure index of those who have been abandoned by God. David soon regretted his rash action and realized he had sinned. May God graciously grant unto reader and writer a sensitive conscience. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord, v6. How honest of David! He not only repented before God of his rash conduct, but he also confessed his wrongdoing unto those who had witnessed the same. It requires much grace and courage to do this, yet nothing short of it is required of us. Moreover, we know not to whom God may be pleased to bless a faithful and humble acknowledgement of our sins. David now let his men know plainly that he was filled with abhorrence for having so insulted his sovereign Lord. Observe how that it was his looking at things from the divine viewpoint which convicted him, he now regarded Saul not as a personal enemy, but as one whom God had appointed to reign as long as he lived. So David stayed his servants with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul, v7. Stayed here signifies, pacified, or quieted them, hindering them from laying rough hands upon the king. 
The first word of this verse is deeply significant, so, in this manner, by what he had just said how evident that God clothed his words with power. Few things have greater weight with men than their beholding of reality in those who bear the name of the Lord. David had honored God by calling the attention of his men to the fact that Saul was his anointed, and now he honored David by causing his honest confession to strike home to the hearts of his men. Thus, by restraining his followers David returned good for evil to him from whom he had received evil for good. But Saul rose up out of the cave, and went on his way, v7. Utterly unconscious of the danger which had threatened him, the king awoke, arose, and went forth out of the cave. How often there was but a step betwixt us and death, and we knew it not. Awake or asleep, our times are in God's hands, and with the psalmist faith realizes thou holdest my soul in life, ps 66 9. None can die a moment before the time his maker has appointed. Blessed is it when the heart is enabled to rest in God. Each night it is our privilege to say, I will both lay me down in peace, and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety, ps 4 8. But how unspeakably solemn is the contrast between the cases of the godly and the wicked, the one is preserved for eternal glory, the other is reserved unto everlasting fire. Such was the difference between David and Saul. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave, and cried after Saul, saying, My lord the king, V.A. Though he would not take the opportunity to slay him, yet he wisely took the opportunity, if possible, to slay his enmity, by convincing him that he was not such a man as he took him for, Matthew Henry. In thus revealing himself to Saul, David intimated that he still entertained an honorable opinion of his sovereign, this was further evidenced by the respectful language which he employed. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth, and bowed himself. How surprised the bloodthirsty monarch must have been in hearing himself addressed by the one whose life he sought. The posture of David was not that of a cringing criminal, but of a loyal subject. The life of David, A. W. Pink. Our actions must not be determined by the opening of the door of circumstance, but by conscience, faith, obedience, and a high sense of Christian honor. Why did David restrain himself from killing Saul in the cave of Engedah? 1 Samuel 24:16-22. And it came to pass, when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice, and wept, 1 Sam 24:16. Though his mind was so hostile to David, and he had cruelly chased him up and down, Yet when he now saw that the one he was pursuing had forborne revenge when it was in his power, he was moved to tears. In like manner, when the captains of the Syrians, whom the prophet had temporarily blinded, were led to Samaria, fully expecting to be slain there, we are told that the king prepared great provisions for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And what was the sequel to such kindness unto their enemies? This it so wrought upon their hearts, their bands came no more into the land of Israel, 2 Kings 6,20-23. May these incidents speak loudly unto each of our hearts. And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand, v20. The realization that God had appointed David to succeed him on the throne, was now forced upon Saul. The providence of God in so remarkably preserving and prospering him, his princely spirit and behavior, his calling to mind of what Samuel had declared, namely, that the kingdom should be given to a neighbor of his, better than he, 1518, and such David was by his own confession, v17, and the portion cut off his own robe which must have been a vivid reminder of Samuel rending his mantle, when he made the solemn prediction, all combined to convince the unhappy king of this. Thus did God encourage the heart of his oppressed servant, and support his faith and hope. Sometimes he deigns to employ strange instruments in giving us a message of cheer. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house, v 21. 
Under the conviction that God was going to place David upon the throne of Israel, Saul desired from him the guarantee of an oath, that he would not, when king, extirpate his posterity. What a tribute this was unto the reality of David's profession. Ah, the integrity, honesty, veracity of a genuine child of God, is recognized by those with whom he comes into contact. They who have dealings with him know that his word is his bond. Treacherous and unscrupulous as Saul was, if David promised in the name of the Lord to spare his children, he was assured that it would be fulfilled to the letter. Reader, is your character thus known and respected by those among whom you move? Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. How tragically this reveals the state of his heart. Poor Saul was more concerned about the credit and interests of his family in this world, than he was of securing the forgiveness of his sins before he entered the world to come. Alas, there are many who have their seasons of remorse, are affected by their dangerous situations, and almost persuaded to renounce their sins, they are convinced of the excellency of true saints, as acting from superior principles to those which regulate their own conduct, and cannot withhold from them a good word, yet are they not thereby humbled or changed, and sin and the world continue to reign in their hearts until death overtakes them. And David swear unto Saul. And Saul went home, but David and his men get them unto the hold, v. 22. David was willing to bind himself to the promise which Saul asked of him, and accordingly swore to it on oath. Thus he has left us an example to be subject unto the higher powers, rom 13 1. His later history evidences how he respected his oath to Saul, by sparing Mephibosheth, and in punishing the murderers of Ishbosheth. It is to be noted that David did not ask Saul to swear unto him that he would no more seek his life. David knew him too well to trust in a transient appearance of friendliness, and having no confidence in his word. Nor should we deliberately place a temptation in the way of those lacking in honor, by seeking to extract from them a definite promise. And Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. David did not trust Saul, whose inconstancy, perfidy and cruel hatred, he full well knew. He did not think it safe to return unto his own house, nor to dwell in the open country, but remained in the wilderness, among the rocks and the caves. The grace of God will teach us to forgive and be kind unto our enemies, but not to trust those who have repeatedly deceived us, for malice often seems dead, when it is only dormant, and will ever long revive with double force. They that, like David, are innocent as doves, must thus, like David, be wise as serpents, Matthew Henry. Note how verse 22 pathetically foreshadowed John 7 53 and 8 colon 1. Here then is the blessed victory that David gained over Saul, not by treacherous stealth, or by brute force but a moral triumph. How complete his victory was that day, is seen in the extent to which that haughty monarch humbled himself before David, and reading him to be kind unto his offspring, when he should be king. But the great truth for us to lay hold of, the central lesson here recorded for our learning is that David first gained the victory over himself, before he triumphed over Saul. May writer and reader be more diligent and earnest in seeking grace from God that we may not be overcome by evil, but that we may overcome evil with good. The Life of David, A. W. Pink David's noble self-restraint awoke the best side of Saul's nature. What effect did this have on Saul and was it a change in mood or will? 1 Samuel 25 1-12 The incident which is now to engage our attention may seem, at first sight, to contain in it little of practical importance for our hearts. If so, we may be sure that our vision is dim. There is nothing trivial in Holy Writ. Everything which the Spirit has recorded therein has a voice for us, if only we will seek the hearing ear. Whenever we read a portion of God's Word, and find therein little suited to our own case and need, we ought to be humbled, the fault is in us. This should at once be acknowledged unto God, and a spiritual quickening of soul sought from Him. There should be a definite asking Him to graciously anoint our eyes, Revelation 3.18 not only that we may be enabled to behold wondrous things in his law, 
but also that he will make us of quick discernment to perceive how the passage before us applies to ourselves what are the particular lessons we need to learn from it. The more we cultivate this habit, the more likely that God will be pleased to open his word unto us. It is the practical lessons to be learned from each section that all of us so much need, and this is uppermost in our mind in the composing of this present series. What, then, is there here for us to take to heart? David, in his continued wanderings, applies to a well-to-do farmer for some rations for his men. The appeal was suitably timed, courteously worded, and based upon a weighty consideration. The request was presented not to a heathen, but to an Israelite, to a member of his own tribe, to a descendant of Caleb, in short, to one from whom he might reasonably expect a favorable response. Instead, David met with a rude rebuff and a provoking insult. Obviously, there is a warning here for us in the despicable meanness of Nabal, which must be turned into prayer for divine grace to preserve us from being inhospitable and unkind to God's servants. But it is with David that we are chiefly concerned. In our last three chapters we have seen him conducting himself with becoming mildness and magnanimity, showing mercy unto the chief of his enemies. There we saw him resisting a sore temptation to take matters into his own hands, and make an end of his troubles by slaying the chief of his persecutors, when he was thoroughly in his power. But here our hero is seen in a different light. He meets with another trial, a trial of a much milder nature, yet instead of overcoming evil with good, he was in imminent danger of being overcome with evil. Instead of exercising grace, he is moved with a spirit of revenge, instead of conducting himself so that the praises of God are shown forth, 1 Peter 2 9, only the works of the flesh are seen. Alas, how quickly had the fine gold become dim. How are we to account for this? And what are the lessons to be learned from it? Is the reader surprised as he turns from the blessed picture presented in the second half of 1 Samuel 24 and ponders the almost sordid actions of David in the very next chapter? Is he puzzled to account for the marked lapse in the conduct of him who had acted so splendidly toward Saul? Is he at a loss to explain David's spiteful attitude toward Nabal? If so, he must be woefully ignorant of his own heart, and has yet to learn a most important lesson, that no man stands a moment longer than divine grace upholds him. The strongest are weak as water immediately the power of the spirit is withdrawn. The most mature and experienced Christian acts foolishly the moment he be left to himself, none of us has any reserve strength or wisdom in himself to draw from, our source of sufficiency is all treasured up for us in Christ, and as soon as communion with him be broken, as soon as we cease looking alone to him for help, we are helpless. What has just been stated above is acknowledged as true by God's people in general, yet many of their thoughts and conclusions are glaringly inconsistent therewith or why be so surprised when they hear of some eminent saint experiencing a sad fall. The eminent saint is not the one who has learned to walk alone, but he who most feels his need of leaning harder upon the everlasting arms. The eminent saint is not the one who is no longer tempted by the lusts of the flesh and harassed by the assaults of Satan, but he who knows that in the flesh there dwelleth no good thing, and that only from Christ can his fruit be found, Hosea 14 colon 8. Look at in themselves, the fathers in Christ are just as frail and feeble as the babes in Christ. Left to themselves, the wisest Christians have no better judgment than has the new convert. Whether God is pleased to leave us upon earth another year or another hundred years, all will constantly need to observe that word, watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, Matthew 26 41. And God has many ways of teaching us the weakness of the flesh. One of these receives striking illustration in the incident to be before us, and which has no doubt been painfully realized in the experience of each Christian reader, that in some great crisis we have been enabled to stand our ground, strong in faith whereas before some petty trial we have broken down and acted as a man of the world would act. It is thus that God stains our pride, subdues our self-sufficiency, and brings us to the place of more real and constant dependence upon himself. It is the little foxes, Song of Solomon 2.15, that spoil the vines, 
and it is our reaction unto the lesser irritations of everyday life which most reveal us to ourselves humbling us through our failures, and fitting us to bear with more patience the infirmities of our brethren and sisters in Christ. Who would have thought that he who had taken so meekly the attacks of the king upon his life, should have waxed so furious when a farmer refused a little food for his men? Rightly did Thomas Scott point out, David had been on his guard against anger and revenge when most badly used by Saul, but he did not expect such reproachful language and insolent treatment from Nabal, he was therefore wholly put off his guard, and in great indignation he determined to avenge himself. Lay this well to heart, dear reader, a small temptation is likely to prevail after a greater has been resisted. Why so? Because we are less conscious of our need of God's delivering grace. Peter was bold before the soldiers in the garden, but became fearful in the presence of a maid. But it is time for us to consider some of the details of our passage. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah, 1 Sam 25 1. How often will people sorrow outwardly for one when dead to whom they did not care to listen when living? There had been a time when Samuel was appreciated by Israel, particularly when they were feeling the pressure of the Philistine yoke, but more recently he has been despised, 1 Sam 8. They had preferred a king to the prophet, but now Saul was proving such a disappointment, and the breach between the king and David showed no signs of being healed, they lamented the removal of Samuel. And David arose, and went down to the wilderness of Paran, 25 colon 1. David too was despised by the greater part of the nation. Once he had been the hero of their songs, but now he was homeless and outlawed. Few cared to own him. Learning of Samuel's death, he probably thought that his danger was greater than ever, for the prophet was more than friendly disposed toward him. He no doubt concluded that Saul's malice would be now more unrestrained than ever. Taking advantage of all the Israelites being gathered together, to mourn the death of Samuel, he left Engedi to sojourn for a while in other parts. But let us note well the ominous hint given in the words and went down to the wilderness of Paran. We have next presented to our notice the one to whom David made his appeal, 1 Sam 25 colon 2, 3. From the character given to him by the Holy Spirit, not much good might be expected from him. His name was Nabal which signifies a fool and none is a greater fool than he who thinks only of number one. He was a descendant of Caleb, which is mentioned here as an aggravation of his wickedness, that he should be the degenerate plant of so noble a vine. We are told that this man was very great, not in piety, but in material possessions, for he had very large flocks of sheep and goats. His wife was of a beautiful countenance and of good understanding, but her father could not have been so for he would not have sacrificed her to a man who had nothing better to recommend him than earthly well. Poor woman. She was tied to one who was churlish and evil in his doings, greedy and grasping, sour and cross-tempered. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. Verses 4, 5. The season for shearing the sheep was a notable one, for wool was a leading commodity in Canaan. With such a very large flock, a considerable number of extra hands would have to be hired by Nabal, and a plentiful supply of provisions prepared. From 2 Samuel 13:23, it appears that it was the custom in those days to combine feasting and merriment with the shearing, compare also Genesis 38:13. It was a time when men were generally disposed to be hospitable and kind. As to how far David was justified in appealing to man, rather than spreading his need before God alone, we undertake not to decide it is certainly not safe to draw any inference from the sequel. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast cheerers, now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day, give, 
I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants, and to thy son David, verses 6 to 8. The request to be presented before Nabal was one which the world would call respectful and tactful. The salutation of peace bespoke David's friendly spirit. Reminder was given that, in the past, David had not only restrained his men from molesting Nabal's flocks, but had also protected them from the depredations of invaders compare verses 14 to 17. He might then have asked for a reward for his services, but instead he only supplicates a favor. Surely Nabal would not refuse his men a few vittles, for it was a good day, a time when there was plenty at hand. Finally David takes the place of a son, hoping to receive some fatherly kindness from him. But as we examine this address more closely, we note the low ground which was taken, there was nothing spiritual in it. Moreover, we fully agree with Matthew Henry's comments on the opening words of verse 6, Thus shall ye say to him that liveth, as if those lived indeed that lived as Nabal did, with abundance of the wealth of this world about them, whereas, in truth, those that live in pleasure are dead while they live, 1 Tim 5 colon 6. This was, methinks, too high a compliment to pass upon Nabal, to call him the man that liveth. David knew better things that in God's favor is life, not in the world's smiles, and, by the rough answer, he was well enough served for this too smooth address to such a muckworm. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased, v9. This verse serves to illustrate another important principle, not only are God's children more or less revealed by their reaction to and conduct under the varied experiences they encounter, but the presence of God's servants tests the character of those with whom they come into contact. It was so here. A golden opportunity was afforded Nabal of showing kindness to the Lord's anointed, but he seized it not. Alas, how many there are who know not the day of their visitation. Nabal had no heart for David, and clearly was this now made manifest. So too the selfishness and carnality of professors frequently becomes apparent by their failure to befriend the servants of God, when chances to do so are brought right to their door. It is a grand and holy privilege when the Lord sends one of his prophets into your neighborhood, yet it may issue in a fearfully solemn sequel. And Nabal answered David's servants, and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread, and my water, and my flesh, that I have killed for my shearers, and give it unto men, whom I know not whence they be? Verses 10, 11. What an insulting answer to return unto so mild a request. To justify a refusal he stooped to heaping insults on the head of David. It was not a total stranger who had applied to him, for Nabal's calling him the son of Jesse showed he knew well who he was, but, absorbed with schemes of selfish acquisition he cared not for him. Let it be duly noted that in acting in such a heartless manner Nabal clearly disobeyed Deuteronomy 15,7-11. Nabal's repeated use of the word my in verse 11 reminds us of the other rich fool in Luke 12,18-20. So David's young men turned their way, and went again, and came and told him all those sayings, v12. Highly commendable was their conduct. Young men are often hot-blooded and hot-headed, and act impetuously and rashly, but they admirably restrain themselves. The language of Nabal had been highly offensive, but instead of returning railing for railing, they treated him with silent contempt and turned their backs upon him, such churls are not entitled to any reply. It is blessed to see they did not use force, and attempt to take what ought to have been freely given to them. Never are the children of God justified in so doing, we must ever seek grace to maintain a good conscience, in all things willing to live honestly, Hebrew 13 18. Oft times the best way for overcoming a temptation to make a wrathful reply, is to quietly turn away from those who have angered us. And came and told him all those sayings. Here we are shown how the servants of Christ are to act when abused. Instead of indulging the spirit of revenge, they are to go and spread their case before their master, Luke 14:21. It was thus the perfect servant acted, 
Of him it is written, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed his cause to him that judgeth righteously, 1 Peter 2.23. Oft times God brings us into trying situations to reveal unto us whether we are acknowledging him in all our ways, prov 3 colon 6, or whether there is still a measure of self-sufficiency at work in our hearts our response to the trial makes manifest which be the case. And what was David's response? How did he now react unto the disappointing tidings brought back by his men? Did he, as the servant of God, meekly bear Nabal's taunts and cutting reproach? Did he cast his burden on the Lord, looking to him for sustaining grace, PS 55 colon 22? Alas, he acted in the energy of the flesh. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword, v. 13. David neither betook himself to prayer nor reflected upon the matter, but hurriedly prepared to avenge the insult he had received. True, the ingratitude which Nabal had shown, and the provoking language he had used, were hard to endure too hard for mere flesh and blood, for human nature ever wants to vindicate itself. His only recourse lay in God, to see his hand in the trial, and to seek grace to bear it. But momentarily David forgot that he had committed his cause unto the Lord, and took matters into his own hands. And why did God permit this breakdown? That no flesh should glory in his presence, 1 Cor 129. This must be the reason why such like episodes are found in the lives of all the Lord's servants. They serve to demonstrate that these servants were not any better flesh than other men, and that it was not more richly endowed brains that gave them faith of devotedness, but simply the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, C.H. Bright. The Life of David, A.W. Pink. Show the striking contrast between David's reaction to Nabal's taunts and cutting reproach and Christ's reaction to an insult. 1 Samuel 25 colon 1335. In our last section we saw how God submitted David unto a testing of quite another character and from a different quarter than those he had previously been tried by. Hitherto, the thorn in his side had been none other than the king of Israel, to which we may add the callous indifference toward him of the nation at large. But now he was unexpectedly rebuffed by an individual farmer, from whom he had sought some victuals for his men. His churlish soul, adding insult to injury, dismissed the messenger of David with contumely and scorn. It is a hard thing to endure. David had endured, and was enduring much. He was suffering from the active enmity of Saul, and from the dull apathy of Israel. But both were great, and so to speak, dignified enemies. Saul was Israel's king, and Israel were God's people. It seemed comparatively honorable to be persecuted by them, but it was a far different thing to endure the reproach of one so despicable as Nabal. Surely in vain, said David, have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, B.W. Newton. What made the trial more poignant to David's soul, was the fact that he himself had acted honorably and kindly toward Nabal. When, on a previous occasion, he had sojourned in those parts, he had not only restrained his own men from preying upon Nabal's flocks, but had been a defense to them from the wandering bands of the Philistines. It was, then, the least that this wealthy sheep owner could do, to now show his appreciation and make present of a little food to David's men. Instead, he mocked them. Ingratitude is always trying to flesh and blood, but more so when it is coupled with gross. Injustice. Yet often God is pleased to try his people in this way, calling upon them to receive treatment which they feel is quite uncalled for, yet, positively unjust. And why does God permit this? For various reasons, among others, to furnish us opportunities to act out what we profess. The reaction of David unto this trial is recorded for our learning, for us to lay to heart, and turn into earnest prayer. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword, 1 Sam 25 colon 13. Well may we ask, had he been so long in the school of affliction and not yet learned patience? 
he forgot that all suffering, all reproach, that is for God's sake, is equally honorable, whether it come from a monarch, or from a churl. His proud spirit was roused, and he who had refused to lift up his hand against Saul, and had never unsheathed his sword against Israel, he who was called to fight, not for his own sake, against his own enemies, but for the Lord's sake against the Lord's enemies, he David, forgot his calling, and swore that Nabal should expiate his offense in blood, B. W. Newton. And how are we to account for his lapse? Wherein, particularly, was it that David failed? In being unduly occupied with the second cause, the human instrument, his eyes were upon man, rather than upon God. When his men returned with their disappointing tidings he ought to have said with Job, Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Job 2.10 Ah, it is easy for us to say what David ought to have said, but do we act any better when we are similarly tested? Alas, has not both writer and reader full reason to bow his head in shame? Far be it from us, who thoroughly deserve them ourselves, to throw stones at the beloved psalmist. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit has faithfully recorded his failures, and the best way for us to profit from them is to trace them back to their source, and seek grace to avoid repeating them. Above we ask the question, had David been so long in the school of affliction and not yet learned patience? This leads us to inquire, what is patience? Negatively, it is meekly receiving as from God whatever enters our lives, a saying from the heart, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? John 18 11. Positively, it is a persevering continuance in the path of duty, not being overcome by the difficulties of the way. Now to accept as from God whatever enters our lives requires us to cultivate the habit of seeing his hand in everything, just so long as we are unduly occupied with secondary causes and subordinate agents, do we destroy our peace. There is only one real haven for the heart, and that is to rest in the Lord, to recognize and realize that of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, ROM 1136 ever seeking to learn his lesson in each separate incident. It is blessed to know that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and that though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth his hand, PS 37 colon 23, 24. Yes, and oft times though we trip, he keeps us from falling. Where it is the genuine desire of the heart to please the Lord in all things, he will not let us go far wrong, where the will is sincerely bent Godwards, he will not suffer Satan to prevail. Thus it was here with David. To answer the fool Nabal according to his folly, PROV 26 4, was just what the devil desired, and momentarily he had gained an advantage over him. But the eyes of the Lord were upon his tempted servant, and graciously did he now move one to deter him from accomplishing his vindictive purpose. Let us admire his providential workings. First, we are told that, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them, when we were in the fields, they were a wall unto us both by night and by day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master, and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial, that a man cannot speak to him, verses 14 to 17. One of Nabal's servants acquainted his mistress with what had transpired, confirming, be it noted, what was said, by David's men in verse 7. He probably drew the logical inference that David would avenge his insult, and anxious for his own safety, as well as for the other members of the household, and yet